All right, so welcome everybody to our High Tunnel Berry Production webinar series. Uh, my name is Amaya Tucha and I'm a fruit crop specialist at University of Wisconsin Madison, and I'll be your moderator for today. We're very excited to for today's um, webinar and to discuss day neutral strawberry production in high tunnels with Dr. Suzanne Slack and Matthew Galaxon. So Dr. Suzanne Slack uh, joined the horticulture faculty at Iowa State University in late 2021, specializing in perennial fruit production. She has a split of teaching, research, and extension. And her research program currently focuses on apple, grape, pear, and strawberry reduction. But she also works with growers on other fruit crops. Dr. Slack's new fruit program at Iowa State aims to improve fruit production in Iowa. And then Matthew Gallison is a PhD student studying spotterwind Drosophila uh, integrated pest management for berry crops. Matthew's love for plants and growing food began as a child helping his, in his parents' garden. He has a BA degree in biology from Gustavus Adolphus College and a master's in science degree in applied plant science at the University of Minnesota. So we're very grateful for both of our speakers to um, you know, dedicate their time to teach us about growing day neutral strawberries in high tunnels. Just a couple of reminders before we start. First of all, try to keep yourself unmuted, uh, sorry, muted and your camera off. Uh, we will be recording this webinar and I will place in the chat the link to the uh, where the recording is going to be. Um, and so if you have any questions during the presentations, there's two options. Either you can type them in the chat or in the Q&A and we'll try to go through as many questions as possible during the end of the presentation from our speakers. And so with that, I think that I'm going to pass it on to Suzanne, who's going to start the webinar. All right. Thank you, Amaya. That was awesome introduction. Um, like you said, I'm Suzanne Slack. Uh, so for my part of today's webinar, I will be just doing some overviews. So um, we'll talk about uh, plastic culture a little bit first to get started. And then we'll talk a little bit about the combination of using plastic culture with tunnels um, and what this kind of means for us, especially in a day neutral system. So first, off, I just wanted to talk a little bit about strawberries in general. So there's three different types of strawberries. Um, there's June bearing strawberries, and that typically what um, what most people think of, they think of strawberries that come uh, late May and June. So these types of strawberries initiate flowers under short day conditions in the fall. Uh, then the flowers open the following spring, and those flowers turn to strawberries, and there's typically one crop. Then there's ever bearing strawberries, which are different than day neutral strawberries, although the terms kind of get mixed around a bit. Um, and a true ever bearing strawberry will initiate flowers under long day conditions. So you end up with a small crop in the spring and then a substantial crop in the fall. Whereas a day neutral strawberry truly is day neutral and it doesn't care about the day length. They'll produce flowers um, regardless of day length and they're more um, inclined to uh, use temperature. So as long as the temperature is between around 40 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit, depending on the cultivar, they will be producing flowers that'll be producing strawberries. So for this seminar, we're mainly focusing on um, day neutral strawberry production. So we're expecting to have flowers and strawberries all season long. Um, in Iowa last year, we were able to get strawberries pretty much from uh, beginning of June all the way into October with, this, uh, with these day neutrals. So what is plastic culture? So whenever we think of plastic culture, there's a lot of different things that come to mind. Whenever we're talking strawberries, plastic culture, however, um, we're starting to treat the strawberries as an annual plant. So that means we're gonna be planting new plugs every year. Uh, some people will plant them in the spring and plant them every year. And you can do this with day neutrals um, or you plant them in the fall, let them over winter, and then you harvest and um, harvest them the next spring to get your crop then. So those are the two ways to do it, planting in spring or planting in fall, letting them over winter. Um, there is a higher cost of production with using plastic culture, especially with day neutral strawberries. However, uh, you have a, a potential higher return per acre. 
And uh, many larger scale operations have switched uh, to plastic culture over matted rows. And then just for um, examples, so everyone knows what we're talking about, this is an example of a uh, plastic culture strawberry. So um, this is one of my growers in Iowa. They planted their strawberries um, the fall before, overwintered them, um, let them come up, and uh, they will go through and um, terminate this crop and then plant another crop into that plastic. Whereas uh, the one below is one of my other strawberry growers in Iowa, and they use a, a matted row system. Um, this particular planting is in its third year. Um, so typically for a matted row, you treat them like a perennial, they'll go the five years. So plastic culture, annual, the matted rows, more of a perennial system. So this is just a, a closer up of uh, my growers field. So uh, in this system, they have, uh, they used a zigzag or um, um, an off leveled type of planting. They want to remove all the runners. Um, they don't want any runners. They just want the plants to focus on fruit production. And this is a pick your own. So they just have some straw matted here to kind of give the um, effect of kind of like a regular strawberry patch. Uh, this, they had a, a verticillium problem. So you can see there's some patches here and here, which doesn't matter for their next crop because they're just gonna rip this out and plant something that's verticillium um, tolerant here. They're not gonna go back into the same plots with strawberries. So with plastic culture, you can't do a strawberry on strawberry. Um, so that your strawberries are gonna have to move um, year to year. There's been some research that suggests um, two years in between is enough. Um, some people say it's more like five or six. So it just depends on what kind of diseases you had your previous year with your strawberries. Um, strawberries are super susceptible to a lot of soil diseases. So benefits of plastic culture, uh, we have an earlier and a longer season. So the strawberries tend to bloom a little quicker on this system. So you can kind of get an edge in the market, strawberries sooner. Um, and the season lasts a bit longer too. The plants stay a little bit warmer. There's that no soil contact. So you have less disease in the canopy and cleaner fruit. There's been some research that suggests that there's less botrytis on these systems. Um, the picking's easier. Um, a lot of my growers who are doing pick your own have switched this and they really like it. They say that their customers like it. The customers end up spending more money because they're picking more berries. Uh, there's also um, some research and it uh, can be pretty obvious that there's an increase in size and quality of fruit when they're grown on plastic culture too. Part of that could be um, you're only getting from that first year's crop that um, really nice first uh, influx of flowers. You don't have as much disease in the planting. So, um, but you do get uh, better sized fruit and better quality fruit. But of course there's downsides. If it was perfect, everyone would already be doing it. Um, whenever we're doing day neutrals, we have to think about extreme weather and that longer season, which means more work. So we need to protect the plants. Um, if you plant in fall, you have to protect them all fall, winter, spring, and summer, because we need our plants to be healthy and um, not have damages. So if there's frosts or if there's um, hail, Weather events, things to think about like that a little bit longer than we would for like a straw for a June bearing strawberry, for instance. So extra costs in time, effort compared to a matted row, better fruit. It's always a trade-off. Uh, the other uh, part that um, is a potential pitfall is you need irrigation on a plastic culture day neutral strawberry um, because of the plastic. So it's about one inch per week of irrigation. Strawberries like water. So then that can be a potential problem depending on what your irrigation systems are in your fields currently. So um, in Iowa, we're currently experimenting with an, um, using a fall planting annual system. There's been a lot of uh, discussion of how late is too late in the fall to plant the strawberries. So we planted three cultivars once per week from mid-August to the second week of September. This was not in a high tunnel, but it was done on plastic. So we can see uh, here, this is what the field looked like one month after the last planting. The ones closest to us were the ones that were planted earlier, so they're two months old. Then this one was planted a week after that, a week after that, and a week after that. A little hard to see from this picture because of, you know, we're looking farther away so the plants look smaller. Um, this is what it looked like the last day of planting, which was September 9th. So we were about to plant this section. So you see here, these plants are, have been in the ground a week. These ones have been in the ground for two weeks, and then the ones here, three weeks. 
So you can kind of see um, already how big of a stark or a drastic difference it made to plant them earlier. Here's my student um, who's getting ready to plant strawberries. Her name's Abby. You can really see, hopefully in this picture at the top, um, they're a lot bushier and they get a lot more thinner as we go through. So um, the more time they have in the ground, the better. It depends on uh, when you can get your, your plugs. Um, sometimes growers have a hard time getting fall plugs um, early enough, or they think. So that's kind of why we're doing this research. Uh, the other thing to think about um, is how many plants you need. So this is from the Mid-Atlantic Berry Guide, but you can kind of see in red. So this is our, on the top, this is our matted row. This is our in-row spacing, 12 inches. Between row spaces, 48. We're looking to expect about a um, little less than 11,000 plants. However, if we have a 48 inch bed spacing and we're doing um, a, a, staggle, a staggered double row or a zigzag row, we're uh, pre pretty much doubling the amount of plants we need. So every year you're planting double the plants. So that's um, where a lot of that expense comes from is you're buying double the plants every single year instead of 10,000 plants once every uh, three to four to five years. So, um, however, the yields are um, incredibly higher and um, people tend to like it. So again, this just wanted to uh, double back to this image. So this grower uses the double staggered or the staggered the zigzag rows um, and they, they really liked it. You can see even though they lost them to, to disease, the other plants nearby were super happy and um, had really no problems. So now getting into combining high tunnels and plastic culture. So this is some research uh, that we're doing at Iowa State right now. Um, this is a pollinator study to figure out um, pollinator practices for high tunnels. Um, but you can see that we have our plastic down, we're using white plastic for the study, and we have all of our plants in a row. So at this point, the plants are um, almost two months old. We were, and here you can see we we're having some, oops. You can see we're having some grass issues. So uh, my students had to come through and do some weeding to get rid of that grass. Um, grass is kind of like one of the number one problems with doing strawberries in plastic culture. The grass grows really fast um, in these openings. And you can see we have our irrigation down. There's a couple um, where you can see the irrigation's not perfectly set. And those plants are a lot smaller than the ones with the irrigation tube directly over the hole. So um, you can use different things to attach them. Um, my students were weeding and you can see like kind of where they were going at this. So um, I'm not sure, I, I forgot to mention which cultivars we're using. Um, so we have Seascape, Albion and Monterey are the three that we're mainly working with to figure out this different timing and pollination work. Um, so in these tunnels, they're actually, you can see this one, there's a, a piece of wood here. So on one side, we have um, uh, one variety and on the other, we have a different one. Um, I think this one over here is Seascape and this one is Albion. So um, that's kind of what uh, we're working on for this study, but you can see that they will be in high tunnels. We didn't put the plastic on until later, um, just because I'm sure some of you can relate to this. We couldn't get the plastic. So uh, we got the plastic and now it's gonna be going on no problem. So uh, this is what it looks like with the irrigation. So we have little holes um, just where the plants are. So um, it is kind of a, a big use of uh, resources that way whenever we're doing plastic culture, but um, it seems to work great. Also, I wanted to point out that we planted these. Um, this picture was about a month after planting. We already have flowers coming up. This is in September. So we had to go through and remove flowers. Um, that first year, if you do a fall planting, you want to remove flowers, even if they're in a high tunnel. Uh, you really want that plant to focus on root biomass, so the crown gets developed and it overwinters better. Uh, something that some folks are also trying out is low tunnels. They're doing low tunnels inside or outside the high tunnels. Um, this is a picture from um, a program on high tunnels that I found um, with high tunnels and low tunnels. So this works really great for winter planted day neutrals. It really increases that early plant growth and can really help with that overwinter uh, survivability, especially if we get really cold temperatures um, close to uh, the fall, close to um, 
those early frosts, like in October or um, even into November, if your plants just don't have that biomass that you're looking for. And uh, these increase temperature quite a few degrees. So weeding and runner, uh, runner removal. So um, this is my grad student, Jeremiah. So he's uh, going through and doing uh, runner removal and uh, weeding at the same time. So weeds can be one of the biggest challenges with this system. So making sure that you're applying a pre-emergent herbicide beneath the plastic, prior to laying the plastic down, um, does an okay job at controlling winter annuals um, out of the row. So for instance, we just did plastic for our whole entire um, green, our whole entire high tunnel. Um, but if you're gonna do something in between, um, some people are using ryegrass or a cereal rye to suppress weeds or just putting straw down for that uh, picturesque look, depending on what your market is. Um, I've read some people using a grammaticide in the spring. Um, there's also some evidence that it could potentially hurt the strawberries and reduce yields. So I think working with um, your local person to figure out what's the best options, the best uh, for figuring out using herbicides in spring. Uh, so spring frost protection is really important because the plastic culture systems are gonna be more susceptible to frost, especially compared to the matted rose system. They bloom earlier, you're more likely to have a frost event. Um, whereas with the day neutral, that's maybe not the end of the world, but you're losing your edge of that early production. So it's just something to think about um, with a frost and getting your plants in the ground early to make sure you get those early flowers. Um, whenever you're doing it in a high tunnel, you're having a little bit of frost protection with that high tunnel going on, but you can also use um, straw or some other covering underneath there. Um, if you're doing one layer of row cover, for instance, it can provide anywhere from two to six degrees of frost protection on a clear still night if you had a sunny day before. Um, but then it's only about one to two degrees of protection if you had a really cloudy day or if it's really breezy um, during the frost event. So just something to think about. Um, some people use um, overhead irrigation in combination um, with day neutral strawberries to they'll have like their strawberries, a cover, and then they'll put um, water or ice on top. I've also seen people lose their whole crop doing that. So I think that's something again, just take some practice and figure out like what the frost events looking like for that sort. Uh, pulling the covers or unburying the plants during mid afternoon if it's really warm allows that heat to build up under the cover on that plastic. So for us in Iowa, whenever we were doing all this fall planting, um, we had a huge frost event mid-October and we had to go and crazily bury and cover all of our strawberries only to have to take the cover off two days later because it went up to almost 60, 70 degrees. So, and then we, of course we had to put it back on shortly thereafter. So there is a little bit more work with plastic culture. Uh, this was inside and outside of our high tunnels um, just to make sure that we didn't lose any of our plants to um, a freeze damage because it was a pretty hard freeze. Uh, and they weren't ready since we just planted them a couple of months earlier. So uh, this is all something to think about whenever you're looking at plastic culture in combination with a high tunnel. And that's all I have. I just wanna thank my fruit team here at Iowa State. Um, I said my lab works on a couple of different crops but we're really strawberry heavy right now. I wanna thank Jeremiah Johnson, my grad student leading a lot of our strawberry projects and um, Abby, Emma and Kiana, which are my undergrad team strawberry and they're doing a lot of cool fun stuff. So that is all I have at, for my part. So um, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Asan. So we're just gonna let um, Matt take over. If you have any questions, just go ahead and just put them in the chat and we'll address all of them at the end of the presentation, at Matt's presentation. All right. Um, thank you, Suzanne, for the... Um, for preceding me. And uh, I'll talk now a little bit more specifically on uh, day neutral strawberries within high tunnel production. Um, some of the outline of things I'm gonna talk about today and goals are to differentiate between day neutral and June bearing strawberries, provide examples of high tunnel day neutral strawberry systems. There's a wide spectrum of ways to grow strawberries in a day or in a high tunnel system and then also talk a little bit about some of the benefits and downsides related to these different systems. 
um, and then also some uncertainties and future directions of research that we're interested in pursuing. So Suzanne mentioned this, but just to reiterate, um, day neutral strawberries are different than June bearing strawberries, and the um, term day neutral means that day length does not matter for flower and fruit production. Um, these varieties will flower and fruit continuously throughout the growing season, no matter how long or short the day lengths are. A few differences between day neutral and June bearing varieties. Um, here up in Minnesota, uh, June bearing varieties are really kind of the traditional standard um, growing system for strawberries. However, there's been increasing interest in um, growing day neutrals. So some differences between the two are that day neutrals are primarily grown as annuals in Minnesota. We'll plant the um, strawberries usually the last week of April or um, first or second week of May and then grow them for the season and then pull them out in the first or second week of November. Um, if you're growing them in a high tunnel, you could potentially grow continue producing fruit through November, um, but November is generally the end point. Um, whereas June bearing strawberries are perennial plants that are grown for three to five years in these perennial matted rows seen here. Um, and they have a much more concentrated harvest window, um, generally four weeks in, in June here in Minnesota. Um, day neutrals are usually grown on plastic mulch or plastic culture like Suzanne um, provided us examples of, um, whereas June bearing are primarily grown on straw mulch. And then the yields for day neutral strawberries are quite a bit higher than June bearing varieties. So um, yields can be up to four to five times as great. And um, this can be a huge uh, economic incentive to grow day neutral strawberries. Uh, this is some uh, harvest data from the past two years of our um, research growing day neutral strawberries in St. Paul. Um, just to kind of illustrate when the peak harvest seasons are going to be for um, these um, day neutral strawberries. This is looking at two different cultivars. Uh, we grew Albion in 2021 and Cabrillo in 2022. And um, over the course of the growing season, we saw there was an initial first flush of flowers um, in June, and then our first harvest was late June, early July. Um, and then the plants really kind of stagnated throughout July until August, and then we saw a huge peak in um, our harvest. And so our peak harvest season here in Minnesota is really between the first week of August through October. Um, which is illustrated by the steepness of these lines. And then the two major pests that I want to talk about just briefly before talking about different production systems are spotted wing drosophila and tarnished plant bug. These are two of the main insect pests for day neutral strawberries. And although they can affect June bearing strawberries, here in Minnesota, June bearing strawberries are generally pretty safe from spotted wing drosophila. And that's because there isn't a real overlap between the harvest season for June bearing strawberries and when spotted wing drosophila is most active here in Minnesota. Um, however, for day neutral strawberries, the harvest season really overlaps with when spotted wing drosophila is most active and at their highest populations. And so um, growers are very concerned about spotted wing drosophila, and I've been doing a little bit of research on this um, for my dissertation. And um, although we do see spotted wing drosophila infesting day neutral strawberries, particularly between August and October, generally um, these are very early eggs that are laid and hardly any larvae are present at the time of harvest. So as long as you're picking your fruit cleanly and um, putting it into cold storage right away, the consumers likely aren't gonna um, be aware of any um, spotted wing drosophila infestations. Um, and then also the cold temperatures of, fr of the fridge will also help um, prevent the eggs and larvae from developing further. Um, tarnished plant bug, on the other hand, it does affect June bearing strawberries and it also affects 
day neutral strawberries. And one of the major issues with tarnished plant bug is um, in day neutral strawberries is that you have a much longer management season. Um, so if you are applying insecticides or other chemical management strategies for tarnished plant bug, it can be really challenging to um, to manage tarnished plant bug following the label restrictions for the number of applications you can make. So having some sort of season-long management system for tarnished plant bug is really important in day-neutral strawberries. And with that, I want to move to production systems a little bit. I am most familiar with open field strawberry production. This has been the focus of my research. And this is strawberries grown on plastic mulch without covering them at all. This is one of the lowest input methods for growing day neutral strawberries and um, is pretty similar to um, annual vegetable production, really. A little more intensive is to grow day neutral strawberries under low tunnels. And these are um, temporary structures where cl clear plastic film is stretched over the strawberry canopy. And um, this has the benefit of being able to move it from year to year as you rotate the fields. A little bit more of an intensive management strategy is to use exclusion netting. Um, this is fine mesh netting that's used um, either as a standalone or to supplement other, um, other production systems, protected production systems. Um, if you are interested in using exclusion netting alone, uh, Andy Petrin from Twin Cities Berry Company, he has a YouTube video, if you searched uh, Twin Cities Berry Company, uh, of him installing uh, exclusion netting over an entire field of day neutral strawberries. And I spoke with him a little bit before this presentation, and he really recommended using this as a way to augment high tunnels. Um, rather than using it on its own because it um, is much easier to install um, in, as, a, um, as a supplement to high tunnels rather than having it be a standalone. And that brings me to the high tunnels, which is clear plastic film stretched over the entire planting area. Um, generally, uh, growers are growing day neutral strawberries in the ground in high tunnels. However, there has been some recent research and recent interest in growing them in the uh, tabletop gutter system seen here in the lower right. And these are um, some of the highest investment sorts of systems short of a full-on greenhouse style production. Uh, to talk a little bit about open field production, like I said, this is very similar to annual vegetable production. So if you have experience with that, Day neutral strawberries are going to be very similar. Um, it's generally um, planting involves shaping raised beds and then stretching the plastic over the raised beds um, seen here with drip line underneath. Um, this is some of the lowest investment in materials. However, you still need to irrigate and fertilize um, because the Plants are producing over the course of the season and um, really require some uh, nitrogen supplemented over the course of the season to continue, continue to have the high yields. In this open field production system, the plants are also the most susceptible to weather and to pests because moisture is falling directly onto the leaves, fruit, and flowers. And then also um, there's not really any protection from frost. So, the image here in the middle is what a strawberry blossom will look like if it's been damaged and killed by frost. So um, this blossom in particular won't actually go on to produce any fruit. So something to keep in mind with an open field production system. Uh, Andy Petrin, he was a former grad student in our laboratory and um, he was looking at the impact of mulches on yield for day neutral strawberries, uh, looking at straw mulch alone here in blue, um, using plastic mulch on its own, and then um, plastic mulch with a low tunnel system. And um, Andy saw that there was the highest yields in the plastic mulch with a low tunnel system. Um, and then the lowest yields were present uh, with straw mulch. And we think straw mulch 
might have had um, some issues with um, um, the carbon in the straw tying up the nitrogen mineralization in the soil. So um, potentially not as much of not as high of soil fertility and then also um, weeds were a little bit more of an issue in the straw mulch compared to the plastic mulch. And then moving on to high tunnels, um, I'll share a few examples of different high tunnels. Um, now, the first here is using a caterpillar tunnel, and these are lower input and cost than a full-size high tunnel. They're semi-mobile, um, not that you would necessarily want to go to the trouble of installing this and having to move it, um, but it is a little more um, temporary than a full-size high tunnel. Um, the plants are planted in the ground, um, either on landscaping fabric or plastic mulch, and this is to help manage weeds as well as to um, keep the fruit clean um, and off of the soil so that um, at the time of harvest there isn't a bunch of um, soil sticking to the surface of the plants or surface of the fruit. Um, these caterpillar tunnels have the benefit of being able to manually raise and lower the sides, and um, this helps to moderate the air temperature as well as increase airflow. However, since these are non-enclosed, um, pests and pollinators are able to move freely um, in this system. So uh, tarnish plant bugs, spiderwing drosophila will be able to move into this um, system. Um, however, pollinators are also able to move in and out as well. Uh, these caterpillar tunnels and all of the high tunnels um, have the benefit of rain prevention. And um, by preventing rain from falling directly on the foliage, flowers, and fruit, um, it helps to prevent fungal pests and botrytis from spreading or gray mold um, from spreading on the fruit. Um, and then also um, having this protected cultivation has the added benefit of being able to harvest in any sort of weather condition. So um, if you were growing strawberries in the open field without any covering, if it was raining, you wouldn't want to be out there harvesting. Um, however, under these high tunnels, you could have um, harvest occurring no matter what the weather is. Um, so that is an added benefit if you are hiring people to harvest or for pick your own. Um, people can come no matter what the day is like. Um, and also with the fruit staying dry, that helps to increase the post-harvest longevity of the fruit um, and um, increase the shelf life. Um, and then a little bit about temperature. So since these high tunnels help to regulate the temperature or moderate the temperature, um, something to keep in mind is day neutral strawberries need average temperatures below 84 degrees Fahrenheit to grow flowers. If you get above this, which um, in the middle of the summer, we can um, definitely reach temperature, average temperatures above 84 degrees Fahrenheit for prolonged periods of time. Um, the plants will just stop producing flowers. Um, they won't die, but it'll just um, take a little bit of time and temperatures will need to drop before they will start producing flowers again. Um, generally, 70 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit is best, and um, they really like cool nights with warm days. Something that we haven't studied in Minnesota, however, growers have reported trying this out themselves, is winter hardiness of day neutral strawberries. So for our research, we'll always pull the plant, we've always pulled the plants out of the field at the end of the growing season. Um, however, some farmers have mentioned that they'll cover their plants with straw in November and then overwinter them um, for the um, following year. And we just um, here at the University of Minnesota, we don't know what the impact of yield is on overwinter day neutral strawberries. So um, that would be a um, potential future research opportunity. Um, since, uh, or oftentimes, growers are planting day neutral strawberries into the soil, 
And when planting in the ground, soil fertility plays an important role. So we recommend testing your soil at the start of the season, or if you suspect there are any problems. Um, strawberries are very sensitive to soil compaction, accumulation of salt, and pH imbalances. And pH imbalance, imbalances will also affect how effective your fertilizer regime is. So um, those are all things to keep in mind when planting in the ground, as well as um, the presence of soil pests, which Suzanne talked about earlier. Um, if you are growing day neutral strawberries in these high tunnels or following day neutral strawberries with um, solanaceous crops like tomatoes or peppers, um, you will have verticillium wilt building up in the soil over time. So it's important to be rotating with non-solanaceous crops. Um, I've heard um, cucurbits like pumpkins or cucumbers are a good alternative um, for rotating in these systems. Um, Moving on to a little bit more of an intensive management system is a full-on high tunnel. Um, and inside of these high tunnels, you can definitely plant in the soil. However, um, in the image seen here, this is an example of hydroponic tabletop strawberries, which has been um, increasing in just grower interest in the past few years for a number of reasons. Um, these are some of the most expensive systems, but the potential is very um, is high for high quality fruit as well as high yields. And research in this area is still ongoing, and um, the system is not quite optimized yet. Um, since these high tunnels are enclosed, um, they you oftentimes will need a need some sort of supplementary pollination, but it also is really beneficial for keeping pests out. Let's see. So. Um, like I said, uh, supplementary pollination is really important for day neutral strawberries because they are blooming continuously throughout the growing season and continuously producing fruit. Um, so um, oftentimes growers will bring in bee boxes. This is an example of a bumblebee box that you can purchase from uh, copper biological systems, but there's a number of sources that you can get bees from. Um, these run for about $160 to $250 a box and are good for an entire season. And um, I believe it's recommended to have one box per high tunnel. Um, in these enclosed systems, biological control also works well because um, bringing in biological um, beneficial insects like um, lady beetles or lacewings um, they have a tendency to disperse if you release them in an open field setting. However, inside of a high tunnel, they'll remain and um, provided that the high tunnel is enclosed. Um, however, by having pollinators and beneficial um, biological control, um, this also can interfere with spray programs. And so um, if you have these beneficial insects in the high tunnel, um, you're likely not going to want to spray because the beneficial insects will also be susceptible to any insecticide sprays that you apply. Uh, this is an example of a multi-bay high tunnel with using the tabletop production system. And um, one of the reason farmers are really interested in this is that it has huge benefits for mobility. Um, even as a fairly young person, um, I can definitely tell at the end of the season that my back is really sore from having to um, crouch and bend over harvesting strawberries three times a week over the course of the 12 week harvest season. And so having strawberries at um, about waist level is really beneficial for uh, mobility improvements. And also by growing in these tabletops, you eliminate a lot of the challenges with soil-borne pathogens because um, you can swap out the potting soil every time you replant. Um, and so the um, amount of verticillium wilt and other soil-borne pathogens is really quite a bit lower. The um, farmers that were using this tabletop system were actually using it as a pick-your-own operation as well. 
um, and consumers were um, really uh, receiving this style of fruit production um, pretty um, happily because it helped. It's pretty easy to pick, pretty easy to see the fruit, and then also the footing is much more even. So people who might have some mobility issues are able to harvest as well. Um, so this is a very interesting um, kind of novel form of strawberry production, but it, I'm curious to see what it'll look like in the next five to 10 years or so. Um, as with open field, fertilizer and irrigation is important. Um, for all of our day neutral strawberry research, we've been recommending a minimum of five pounds of water soluble nitrogen fertilizer applied through the irrigation system per acre per week. Um, and at least in Minnesota, you need a permit through our Department of Agriculture if you are going to be applying um, fertilizer through any sort of irrigation system. So um, just keep that in mind. Um, but um, we've been being pretty successful at achieving about one pound of fruit per plant um, using this five pounds of nitrogen per acre per week. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about exclusion netting. Um, this is somewhat untested as a standalone practice in strawberries. We haven't done any um, just purely exclusion netting tunnels for strawberries. The example seen here is using um, fall bearing raspberries. Um, but some of the benefits of using exclusion netting is that it's a temporary structure and the airflow is generally better than enclosed plastic. And um, the exclusion netting can reduce nearly all insect infestation. So then you would save money on insecticide application. Um, some of the downsides of using exclusion netting is that it can be expensive as an initial investment. The rolls we use are 27 feet by about 328 feet um, or 8 meters by 100 meters, and those run for about uh, $1,500. Um, some other downsides are that there is a little bit of do-it-your-own involved where you might have to do some sewing in order to get the right dimensions for your system. And then also, um, since these um, Exclusion netting is just a fine mesh that allows for airflow. It doesn't really provide any benefit of temperature or moisture regulation. So um, rain is going to fall on the fruit. And then also, if you get an early frost, um, that could affect the fruit as well. So then uh, just briefly, I want to talk about um, tarnished plant bug and spotted wing drosophila. When I started this research, um, we weren't sure how major of a pest spotted wing drosophila was going to be for day neutral strawberries. Um, and um, from some of the data I've collected, we do see spotted wing drosophila in day neutral strawberries, but it is generally just one or two eggs here or there. Um, in the most peak uh, season, so August and September for strawberry harvest, we might see upwards to 60% of the fruit infested, but it's generally just one or two eggs at a time. And um, as long as the fruit is going directly into cold storage, these eggs won't develop further. So spotted wing drosophila is more or less a minor pest compared to tarnished plant bug, which really visually affects the fruit quality. So this here is an example of tarnished plant bug damage for day neutral strawberries or just strawberries in general. And tarnished plant bug nymphs damage the flowers. They have a piercing sucking mouth part that um, they use to suck the juice out of the strawberry blossoms. And so you really want to manage tarnished plant bug during the blooming period. And for day neutral strawberries, that is primarily July through September. Um, it's going to be affecting the fruit one month before harvest because it go, it takes approximately one month to go from bloom to harvest. Um, like I said, it causes this cat facing phenomenon in strawberries um, where you have a dense clustering of seed right at the apex of the fruit. Um, and the fruit might be smaller and also uh, ripen inconsistently. 
some tactics for tarnished plant bug is to really focus on weed removal, ex um, utilize exclusion netting as barriers in high tunnels, or um, to spray. This is an example of what tarnished plant bug can do to the overall harvest over the course of the season. For my research, I wasn't actually applying any treatments to manage tarnished plant bug, but we were recording the amount of tarnished plant bug damaged fruit. And we saw at the end of the season, roughly 40% of our total harvest was rendered unmarketable um, purely due to tarnished plant bug. So um, although spotted wing Drosophila might be affecting some of the fruit, um, tarnished plant bug is really going to affect a large proportion of the fruit and is going to be the primary pest that you want to focus on to make sure you're um, having the highest quality of fruit possible. And then to end, um, speaking of marketability for fruit, um, we see an average of one pound of fruit per plant per year here in Minnesota, or about one to two pounds per foot of row. And then the marketable yield varies quite a bit. Um, from the previous figure, we expect about a half pound of fruit per plant, but if you're managing tarnished plant bug really well, um, that marketability can really increase substantially. Um, here in the metro area, there's really a high demand for strawberries at farmers markets with um, people talking about selling out really quickly or just not having enough strawberries to meet demand. And um, I've heard the same being said for pick your own systems. Um, here in the metro area, six to eight dollars is pretty common to see per pint of um, locally grown strawberries, and that value can be higher if they are organically grown as well. One of our collaborators on our strawberry research is Gigi DiGiacomo in the Applied Econ Department, and she did a cost or a net return analysis of um, day neutral strawberries based on how um, based on the amount of yield that we're getting from our strawberries and the amount of inputs that are going into the field. And in an open field system, um, if you have a marketable yield of approximately a half pound of fruit per plant, um, your break even point is going to be uh, right around $6.50 per pound. However, as the marketability increases, um, so does your net returns. And I think that's all I have, but I'd be happy to take any questions now. All right. Well, thank you to both speakers for um, all the knowledge that they share with us. I want to put in the in the chat a couple of links uh, to. First of all, we did have uh, a previous webinar on day neutral strawberry production in open field that covers a lot of maybe some uh, topics more related with nutrition and also establishment and how to build those beds in the open field and also a mul plastic mulch application. And I'm going to put that here in the chat. It's in our uh, YouTube channel. You can watch that one there. I also I'm going to repost for those that join us later uh, another webinar that we did um, last year on that very interesting system that um, Matthew presented on the tabletop this is also from the University of Minnesota so I'm working on there on uh, establishing day neutral strawberries on uh, tabletop um, and these were open field but also I think that there's some information about high tunnel so those two are there the other thing that before we go to any of the questions, I want to uh, launch a poll that we have. So if people could just help us answer uh, this uh, poll, that would be great. Um, this really help us improve our webinars and maybe, you know, you let us know what are the things that we can do better. Um, the other thing that I also want to tell is that my experience and what I've heard from growers is that the growing day neutral strawberries in high tunnels uh, really renders very well for organic production and a lot of the growers I know in Minnesota we have had other growers participate in this webinar series uh, think this is a fantastic way of growing um, day neutral 
organic strawberries through the protection of the high tunnel, which can be a little bit challenging something, sometimes to achieve when you grow the nipple strawberries on open field. So that is just you know, another one of the pluses of having these protective structures. So I'm gonna go ahead and read the first question and please go ahead and, and you know, type your questions if you have questions in the chat. The first one is, can the neutral strawberries be managed perennially? Is it possible to manage a runners with selected plants? I currently have a high tunnel, but it's for personal and community use and not commercially. So I don't know if either uh, Matthew or Zizan wanna answer the trying to grow them in a perennial way. Um, where, where are you located? We'll see if we get a response for that. Uh, Southern Minnesota. What do you think, Matthew? I think, you know, provided that they're covered with straw at the end of the season um, and have a good layer of insulating material, um, you know, even if there is like enough snow um, on top of them, I think they could be overwintered successfully based on what I've heard from other growers in um, southeast Minnesota. Um, but we just really don't know what the impact of yield is going to be for the second year. Um, so I'd say it's worth a try in a small section, but um, I wouldn't necessarily plan on having 100% successful overwintering. Right. And then it also might be possible just as the, you know, June bearing strawberries that are perennial that over time the yield will decline, you know, even more. So maybe the second year you have some decline in yield, but then by the third, the third year is year is a useless uh, space in your high tunnel if you if you keep those those plants for for a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then um, speaking on the managing runners. Um, part of the question. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that some of these varieties are copyright protected and um, when you purchase the strawberry, the bare root strawberries initially, you're paying a, um, a fee that goes to like the breeders or whoever developed the strawberries. Um, and, you know, as, as long as you're not like selling these runners and whatnot, um, it's probably fine, but you don't want to run into issues where you're propagating strawberries and that sort of thing. Um, so that's just one thing to consider with runners. We've really found that managing runners over the course of the season is as labor intensive as weeding is, um, just because as the plant canopy gets bigger, um, it gets harder to find the runners and the plants are producing more runners over the course of the season. So, um, you know, staying on top of it's really important before the runners get too long. Thank you. Um, there's another question in the chat about how to scout for tarnish plant bug. Yeah, um, it's pretty easy to scout for tarnish plant bug. Um, what we do is we have a sheet of paper on a clipboard and then we'll go down the rows and um, just tap the flower clusters and the nymphs for tarnished plant bug don't have any wings. And so as you tap the flowers, the nymphs are gonna fall onto the white sheet of paper and then you can count them. And it's recommended to initiate some sort of um, management program when you're finding seven nymphs out of 50 flower clusters. Um, so if you go down your row and are just keeping track of how many flower clusters you're tapping onto the sheet of paper. Um, if you hit seven nymphs before you hit 50 flower clusters, then it's time to manage um, tarnished plant bug because that is when the um, populations are going to start really economically affecting the yield. Great, thank you. I, I have a question, a follow up question about that. Do you know if there's any significant difference in tarnished plant bug infestation or population when you grow denitral strawberries inside the tunnels versus in the open field? I don't know that um, for sure. We haven't done any research on that at the U of M. Um, 
I've heard anecdotally that there are less tarnished plant bug in high tunnels, and I don't know if the plastic interferes with their like vision or ability to locate the plants or just not as ideal of environmental conditions for tarnished plant bug. Um, but, you know, if you're in a high tunnel and have things fully enclosed, the bugs are large enough that they're not going to be able to get through the mesh netting. Um, so that's a great way to manage them without having to spray. Great, thank you. We have another question here in the chat. Could you speak more about why spotted wind drosophila is not as big a problem in strawberries as it is, for example, in raspberries? Shorter yeah. ripening time of the fruit? Yeah, so one of the reasons that a couple papers have mentioned as why spotted wing drosophila is more of an issue in raspberries compared to strawberries is um, raspberries are a much softer fruit. They have a um, much thinner skin and also the um, sugar and protein concentration in raspberries are just a little more optimal for um, spotted wing drosophila. And so um, the populations can get really high really quickly in raspberries, whereas um, with strawberries, it's a little bit more of a firmer fruit. The nutritional composition of it isn't quite as ideal for Dana or for spotted wing. So um, those are like two of the main reasons there. Yeah, and I have to say that we we have a um, a project on evaluating organic protection of denutrol strawberry in Wisconsin and in conjunction with Minnesota. And last year when we harvest all our food, we saw like minimal, the same results as the Minnesota and almost no spotted winter software. It doesn't seem to be a big issue in strawberries while the uh, raspberry patch that we had adjacent to the initial strawberries had plenty of infestations for a winter so it's not the fact that the flies are not there it's just as as matthew was saying the 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 preferred host seems to be raspberries for sure well i don't i don't see any other questions uh, i think that you know very interesting the possibility of overwintering that was presented today and we're looking forward to learning more about the sands uh, research results. I just want to thank both of you, Matthew and Suzanne, for, for your time and for presenting this information. I posted again the link to uh, where the uh, recording of this webinar is going to be. So if you want to go back and, and revisit, you can also find a lot of other webinars that we've done in this series of uh, growing berries in high tunnels. And we have two more webinars this uh, year for this same series, one on growing brambles. So that's gonna be for raspberries. And also we're gonna have very excited a speaker to talk about blackberry production in high tunnels. And then the last um, webinar that we will have for the series is on April 13, is on controlling the environment in a high tunnel. And before we close, I'm going to put the link to our uh, website where you can actually go and sign up for either the newsletter that we have during the growing season with information about growing uh, berries, but also if you go to the menu on the upcoming events, you will be able to sign up for these other two webinars that we'll have in March 30 and April 13. So thank you very much for attending.